पुतला ये सब पिघल गए पहुंचाए दी कलकत्ता घेरक भीतर बंद करी सब टेक के बैठे मथा हर कौन जाल में फंसे आए अब दया करो भगवान वाहो का हलवा सुन लो पीढ़ी बाजिया Fourteenth May is very significant for all Fiji Indians. For the present generation, it reminds them of Colonel Sitaveni Rambuka and the coup of 1987. But for Girmitiers like Lalta, Beni Singh, Bipti, Badlu, Asgar, Ulfat, Pole, and Fakir Bakhs. This day in 1879 was more significant. On this day in 1879, the ship Leonidas carried these eight and 455 other Indian Girmatiers to the Fijian shores from India for the first time. The Fiji Times dated May 17, 1879, reported that cholera had been on board together with smallpox, and that 11 coolies had died of cholera and six of dysentery. The British in those days referred to all Indians as coolies. The coolies on board the Leonidas were the first sample hospitality of their unknown masters in the new land. They were to serve their gimmit or indenture. which was a work contract lasting a minimum of 5 years these brave men women and children were thrown in the deep end they were expected to adjust and adapt to anything and everything imaginable to you and me it was a totally new and frightening experience बर वो पाया जिसको कहते हैं लवे निदा हर कोई आया झगड़ा करके कोई देखन चला तमाशा गली बीच मिल गए यार काटी खूब लगा इस झासा These men and women followed in one of the 87 ships with a total of 62,837 Girmatiers. Girmat ended in 1916 with the last ship Sutledge 5 which arrived on 11th of November 1916. This was a human labor trade between Fiji and India which spanned for more than 40 years. According to Professor Bridge Lyle's most recent book Chalo Jahaji, Girmat started in 1834 with the first lot of Girmatiers. The first lot were destined for Mauritius. This was followed by British Guiana, Trinidad, Jamaica, Mauritius, St Lucia, Natal, St Kitts, St Vincent's, Reunion, Suriname, Fiji, East Africa, and Seychelles. Mauritius, British Guiana, Natal, and Trinidad were the top 4 indentured labor importing colonies. Interestingly, of the 1,166,157 indentured laborers who left India, only 60,965 or 5.2% went to Fiji. सोहनवा हो कहनवा सुन ले पी 
The journey from India to Fiji took up two months. They witnessed many sunrises and sunsets over the ocean. For these brave young men and women who had probably never seen the ocean, nor left the boundaries of their villages, this must have been a terrifying ride. The changing face of the ocean was probably as frightening to these grimmeteers as their colonial carers. As each day passed, they must have wondered what would tomorrow bring. <laughs> Probably the sight of friendly dolphins momentarily eased their suffering and uncertainty. It was indeed tough, but it developed a new bond between the passengers. Caste, religion and race was of little significance. They were Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Tamils and others, but on the ship they were all Jahaji or co-passenger in a ship. The Jahaji spirit developed through goodwill, endurance and common suffering prevailed amongst many of the Girmitiers for most of their lives. But what was the connection between Fiji, India and Britain? The answer is simple. Fiji became a British colony in 1874. An Australian firm, Colonial Sugar Refiner and Company Limited, which had been in operation for more than 40 years in other British colonies, began its operations in Fiji in the late 1870s. <laughs> The success of sugarcane plantations was one of the ways in which the colonial powers could make this new colony self-supporting. Fiji's second governor, Sir Arthur Gordon, who had previously served in Trinidad and Mauritius, had two major problems. First, a dwindling supply of plantation workers, and second, he had to preserve a native policy which safeguarded Fijians from labour lines. India had an endless supply of cheap and reliable labour. At the time, India was also a British colony. So the governor's desire was quickly transformed into reality. <laughs> Recruiters were organised in various parts of India to engage potential workers. According to Professor Bridge Lal's research, of the 45,439 Calcutta embarked migrants, 34,388 or 76% came from Oud and Northwest provinces. This was followed by Bihar, Central provinces, the Punjab, Rajasthan, Nepal, Bengal, and Madras. Interestingly, about 2% came from overseas colonies. A lot has been said and written about the recruitment process. All sorts of stories can be recalled by the present descendants of these labourers on how their forefathers were brainwashed into leaving their homeland. Recruiters who were Indians used all sorts of techniques to convince potential clients to sign up. Their unreliable role in the sign-up process earned them the title of Arkatis. I 
लगेला सोहनवा हो कहनवा सुन ले बीजी बाँसिया अरे वही आवाज की इन बीजी को गारिल खोल पतिनवा हो कहनवा सुन लो बीजी बाँसिया K. A. Gillian's book titled The Fijian Indians, published in 1962, describes the recruitment process as follows. It is the ordinary villager's cupidity which is the lever most frequently used. If he is the stupid, ignorant type, then Fiji is referred to as a district near Calcutta where high wages are paid. If the villager is of the more intelligent type, then full details of indenture are revealed. But the work is made out to be very light indeed, and the most glowing prospects are offered. Nothing is said about the penal laws or the hard condition of penal labor. While some were fooled into a trap, others were truly in search of work. The village scene in India offered little in terms of prosperity and guarantee of a regular income. There were perhaps little hope, not only for themselves, but for their future generations as well. So Fiji, wherever it was, was probably the best option. Their decision to walk into the unknown must have been a painful experience, not only to themselves, but also to their relatives and village friends. Their departure from their villages must have caused real distress. Let's put ourselves their loved ones in their position, leaving loved ones behind and heading into the unknown. <laughs> Once the Girmatiers got to their respective departure points, like Calcutta, they were issued with immigration passes. There was a clear distinction between a man's and a woman's passes. A thumbprint was another distinguishing feature. Most of the Girmatiers were illiterates, and this was the only way to confirm the acceptance of the Girmit or five-year contract. There were other details about the Girmitia, such as particulars of his or her registration, their name, father's name, age, caste, name of next of kin, district, Tana, village, Mohalla, body marks, occupation in India, height, and so on. Various other signatures followed. There was a signature by the depot doctor, which was countersigned by the surgeon superintendent. This confirmed a person's fitness. There was a signature by the government immigration agent for Fiji who claimed that he explained all matters concerning their engagement in Fiji. How were the translations done is anyone's guess. Finally another signature by the protector of immigrants confirmed the Girmatiers fitness to undertake the voyage. <laughs> Prior to their assignment to a plantation in Fiji, they were quarantined at Nukalau, which is an island off the coast of the city of Suva. In each area, there were numerous plantations with various numbers of workers. In the Batavua area, plantations at Rarawai, Tavua, Baroko, Bisaru had most workers. In the Lotoka Nandi area, plantations at Lotoka, Lovu, Drasa, Saweni had most workers. In Maduata, Lambasa had by far the most workers. In the Kondrove, Vuna and Selyalevu plantations had most workers. In Navua, Tamanua and Lobu were two of the larger plantations. A very small number of workers in Suva were assigned to Lami, the works department, the cemetery and Nasinu. 
In the Lao group, Mango Island had most workers. In the Nandronga area, plantations at Kavanangsau, Nandovi, Vaivandra Vandra and Lomoai had most workers. In the Rekireki area, the plantation at Penang was the largest. In the Lomaiviti group, the largest number of Indian indentured labourers were assigned to Makungai Island. The Rewa area had the largest number of plantations. However, the three largest were situated in Nosori, Naitasiri and Baulevu. <laughs> Once the guillemotiers arrived at their respective plantations, they were assigned to their poorly ventilated single room home in a coolie lane with some basic necessities. For the early guillemotiers, this one room unit was their bedroom, living room, and kitchen all in one for up to four people. This multi-purpose shelter measured no more than 10 feet by 7 feet. In today's terms, it was no larger than the smallest bedroom or laundry in our homes. The form of agreement for intending emigrants outlined their girmit or condition of indenture. Girmitiers were assigned to duties involving cultivation or manufacture of products. They were to work for five and a half days a week with Sundays and holidays being free. They were paid at the rate of one shilling or twelve pennies for men. and nine pennies for women. They had a choice of time work, which comprised of a nine hour day, or task work, which involved finishing a task with no time constraints. Life on the plantation has often been described as a harrowing experience. As the sun set in one direction, the evening probably brought momentary relief, together with time to reflect and dream about those back home. But where there is life, there is hope. Most Girmitiers never gave up. For a small percentage, the experience was far too intense, and sadly they committed suicide. Some lost their lives through illnesses such as TB and accidents. Through their leaders, such as Totaram Sanadhya, they expressed their feelings to people back home. Letters were even written to Mahatma Gandhi, and one of his replies in Totaram Sanadhya's book, My 21 Years in Fiji, was as follows. I received your letter hearing the sad story of Hindustani brothers. There I am sorrowful. There is no chance of sending a barrister from here. No one suitable to send is available. You should send to me whatever news you wish. I will send word of it to the other countries. I will always think about the difficulties of the steamer. For all those things in Fiji, there should be a nationally minded person, well read in English. If one comes to mind, I will send him. I will wait for your next letter. Yours sincerely, Mohandas Karamchandra Gandhi. Whatever the grievances and difficulties, life had to go on. The colonial powers, 
and early entrepreneurs tried everything in this new colony. Indentured labor was used on rubber plantations. Indentured labor was used in all aspects of the sugar industry. This involved planting, harvesting and milling cane. It also involved transporting it on horse-drawn carts and boats to sugar mills. If sugarcane plantations could speak, they'd probably tell the full story. They were involved in the construction of railroads as shown in this picture which was taken somewhere in Nandronga. An overseer, or Kulambar, is looking on as many Girmatiyas take on the task with their bare hands and other primitive tools. Some of our ancestors worked on other types of plantations and factories. Despite all the adversities and hardships, our ancestors never gave up. They probably had one goal in mind, and that was to succeed, irrespective of their conditions. After their gimmick, those who call, chose to call Fiji home moved on from their small rooms in the coolie lanes to small homes and farms. They set their own routines and moved on with their lives. The impact that the first settlers had made in the new homeland is best summed up by the following entry, which was made by a government official in 1898. I was struck by the signs of industry of the free Indian settlers. In fact, it is not possible to travel up the river without noticing on either bank evidences of aptitude, push and perseverance of the free Indian with his stores, farms and smiling plantations. The free Indians were accommodated on CSR estates, which was subdivided into small farms. The company depended heavily on these farmers 
for the supply of sugarcane to its mills. Yeah, I'm